Find your seats, please. Uh, just some practical information. You're now allowed to take your seats. Okay. Um, uh, for your information, um, the lunch will be at the restaurant Haskal um, up in the, the shopping center. Um, just follow the flow. Uh, the name of the restaurant is Haskal. Uh, for Norwegians, it's not written with an age. It doesn't start with a. Uh, don't, so don't look for a restaurant starting with an H. It starts with an R. Uh, but it's pronounced Haskal, but I couldn't I couldn't really say rascal in in English <laughs> because that wouldn't that wouldn't translate very very well. So Haskal, uh, after this session is over, uh, don't leave until you've picked up your lunch voucher right outside because that is what will give you a free lunch. Um, and um, if you want to leave your stuff in here, this room will be closed and sealed until after lunch. If you need, if you need your things during lunch, bring them. But if you don't need uh, your bag or, or uh, something until we come back here, then you can leave it here and it is it, it is safe. It will be safely guarded. Okay, uh, we are now ready for uh, the next uh, session. And uh, we are starting with a response uh, to uh, Taron's uh, keynote speech. It will come from uh, Antonio Botelho from the University of Candido Mendes here in Rio. And uh, if you have questions also regarding uh, uh, these things, we might have uh, time for that towards the end. Yes. Welcome. How do we move this thing here? No, it's not moving. Like the presentation got cut here. <laughs> anyway, so let me. Anyway, I'll just. Uh, see, like we only got the final part. No. Yeah, I don't know what, what I don't know what happened here, but anyway, let's start from here. <laughs> let's start from the results, and I'll I'll just make the introduction. Anyway, first of all, thank you for the. Well, I could, uh, but I'm not gonna waste a lot of time on that. But anyway. Thanks for the invitation, for the Innovation Norway and FINEP, you know, for having me here, for this, uh, making these comments on the superb presentation of uh, my colleague Tara. Uh, it's just, I'm particularly grateful because I've been collaborating with Norwegian colleagues uh, as long as the, Nove the November conference, in fact, since 2011. I've had projects with colleagues from the Standalone Research Institute in Niebuhr, uh, which is now part of Oslo Met University in Oslo, and then uh, part of the CIVAC project and a minor role colleagues in Bergen, and now we are just launching a new product with the uh, University of Oslo colleagues, which I'll hopefully you know, Tara and Helge, who's the coordinator, is going to be able to talk about. Uh, so, um, so first of all, I mean, I'm very, uh, in a way, very easy for me to, in a way, to, to build upon all the, the excellent presentation that Tara did, you know, and I'm going to try to uh, to make a couple of remarks, you know, based on, on her analytical conceptual framework. Uh, what, so what's, what are some of the differences? You know, in fact, I mean, since I missed you know, the first part of my presentation here, but I had titled Nature, Nurture, and Change, how you can transform the Brazilian oil and gas innovation system. And what I mean by well, nature, you know, of course, so the, same, the same meaning that Taran put up you know, in terms of what the conditions, the geological conditions of uh, exploration in Brazil were different. The challenge, of course, will be different. You know, of course, the Brazilian innovation system first has been centered on Petrobras, as we all know. And also, we'll be shifting from the oil from the, from the campus basin into ultra deep and open salt. So, the, the geography has shifted too. So, we have a shift also in the nature. 
but the very nature of the industry itself in Brazil, now I'm talking about nature in a broader sense in terms of what are the conditions of the industry in Brazil in the, in the oil and gas system. Uh, first of all, differently from what Norway had, you know, we did not have you know, a, a pool of suppliers to start developing this industry. You know, we had Petrobras, who did 99% of their R&D and innovation. And then you have all you know, the foreign suppliers who are with uh, through the local content policy since the early 2000s came to Brazil. So, but uh, you have a very concentrated you know, uh, uh, R&D system within Petrobras. And there's not much else being done elsewhere. And of course, Petrobras works a lot with academia, with a lot of research institutes. And, and more and more, you know, over the last few years, you see that Petrobras, the, all the major partnerships for research and development have been with first year suppliers, you know, foreign suppliers who have established factories in Brazil and you know, focus more on the manufacturing side of it. So in this sense, the nature of the system in Brazil is somewhat different from what it had in, uh, in Norway, either from the beginning or the current one. The challenges are different because the nature here is different. We're gonna go into the pre-salt, utter deep water, and of course the, the requirements, the technological requirements, the innovation requirements are quite different too. So in that sense, the nature here is gonna be different. In terms of the nurturing, or like how nurture in the original presentation, I mean, what are the support to innovation? Uh, Brazil, of course, uh, has uh, had you know, a series of uh, R&D programs you know, through the ANP, but also more recent through FINAP you know, and uh, BNDES. So the oil and gas has received a lot of funding from, this, uh, from, this, uh, from these institutions. So we have several programs that have out R&D, but I uh, had some numbers and I'm gonna unfortunately disappear from the presentation, but I mean, basically Petrobras you know, had 95% of all the R&D you know, through this funding. Nowadays, uh, it has gone down a little bit. And as the, as the Brazilian market and industry has opened up, you know, with the new, new uh, oil and gas companies coming into Brazil, some predictions that the Petrobras you know, share of R&D is gonna go down to 60%. So, so that's one thing to keep in mind, you know, in keeping in mind the, the relationship with the Norwegian, the model of the Norwegians, you know, that now you're gonna have more oil companies in Brazil doing more R&D, and also they're gonna bring probably different suppliers. So you're gonna be a more diversified structure you know, in the framework that uh, Taran Turi mentioned. So in this sense, you know, Brazil is going to be a different, uh, a different scenario, a different uh, way to nurture now this transition or this change you know, towards our oil and gas innovation system. But the, the initial point you know, that I want to make in relation to the previous presentation and comment on the presentation that is that Brazil did not have you know, an, an actual oil and gas innovation system. It had a Petrobras innovation system. So in the sense you know, that Adam beautifully put, you, know, you need something much more, you need a density, you need a collaboration between suppliers. You know, we didn't really have that in Brazil. We still don't have that in Brazil. So we have this gap in our structure in terms of a building uh, oil and gas innovation system. Uh, so in, 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 as part of that, you know, uh, as part of uh, one of these collaborations I had in my first project with Norwegian colleagues, you know, in this, uh, this, this slide that started here, so I started from here, you know, we did a survey with the uh, Brazilian suppliers, you know, in the same way that Tarden uh, developed their own database, you know, we tried to develop our own database bottom up, you know, trying to, figure out who are the suppliers for industry, because as she mentioned, you know, oil and gas is not, uh, it's not an industry in itself. It takes supply from several industries, you know, and that's something that became very clear to us also in Brazil. Why, when you start looking at the uh, sort of second tier and third tier suppliers, you know, they come from the foodstuff industry, they come from the aeronautics industry, they come from the metallurgical sector, I mean, the sh whatever shipbuilding there is or there was, so, but it's a very diverse sector. And so what I'm, this slide here talks about is the, this, sur this uh, survey we did about 600 firms uh, trying to figure out what's, if, first, if there is any in innovation in Brazil happening, you know? And in fact, that's the, so that's the, the table that was uh, left, you know, here in the, in the presentation. Sorry for, for presenting you some of the raw data, you know, but the one thing that came out in, in this survey, you know, is that we realize that the supply chain in Brazil doesn't do much innovation. That's what this uh, table, the first table is telling us. I mean, in terms of OEG product innovation, you know, out of uh, almost 600 firms, you know, only 35% do some sort of innovation. So innovation is not part of the, the practice of a Brazilian suppliers, different in many ways uh, to what happened in Norway. So that's something to keep in mind when you think about evolving the Brazilian uh, oil and gas uh, innovation system. And then when you also when you look you know, uh, at what kind of innovation in terms of product innovation, mostly it is improvement in products, not completely new products. So the supply chain in Brazil you know, is uh, very deficient in terms of innovation. It's deficient in terms of absorptive capacity, in terms of learning and technology, uh, which is critical for the, for the oil and gas industry you know, uh, innovation system, as uh, Tarun put. So that's one problem that we have in Brazil. So it's one gap when you contrast and compare with, uh, with the Norwegian system. 
And but one result, a positive result that came out in a way fits into the mold of the, of the explanation that Taran presented us, that in Brazil, no, we, we do have what we call collaborative upgrading. So when you look at the supply chain of this, uh, of these foreign suppliers who dominate the first tier, either service suppliers or, or manufacturing suppliers, you know, lockers, FMC, you know, people who build the big equipments, they do know, they do what they call collaborative upgrading. So upgrading coll collaboration does exist in the industry. And you see a lot of ac action happening. So what are some of the results that come out of this collaborative, what you call collaborative upgrading? So the Brazilian owned companies do more upgrading. What do you mean by upgrading here? Upgrade is not really innovation, but it's, uh, it's a step towards innovation. In the sense, you acquire capabilities you know, to adapt to the needs and requirements of a client. So let's say a second or third year, tier supplier, you know, I met some uh, Acker colleague and we interviewed some suppliers at Acker's. They are able to help you know, suppliers to develop you know, new skills, new machinery, new practices, you know, to be able to, to meet you know, Acker's requirements for the subsea production. So you see a lot of that happen in Brazil. That's one positive result that came out of the survey. Uh, ONG specialists and service companies upgrade more. So these are some results that came from this, uh, from this survey. I mean, we don't have an explanation for all of them because, I mean, these are statistical data. We don't, the next step will be like, you know, go back into the suppliers and learn more about it. For the manufacturing companies outside of Sao Paulo, upgrade more. So, I mean, suppliers outside of the Sao Paulo industrial hub, you know, they seem to upgrade more, which makes sense because, uh, Sao Paulo manufacturing suppliers you know they already have a certain level, so they don't really need to upgrade in terms of developing new skills and new capabilities. And uh, one, uh, one result that we haven't been able to answer now is the relatively recent established suppliers between 14 and 39 years upgrade less than very established one, which also could be explained in the sense of you know, older suppliers in Brazil, which have supplied you know, older industries in Brazil or other maturing industries in Brazil, you know, they, they already know how to deal with uh, with their clients, so they know how to absorb this capacity. So these are some results which in a way, so just, I mean, summing up, you know, Brazilian suppliers don't do much innovation, but I mean, they do a lot of collaborative upgrading. So part of the equation that Tata and Turner presented to us, where the oil and gas innovation system has to do more collaborative innovation, at least we have the collaboration seeds here. So we have to figure out how to move about doing more of that. So collaborative upgrading you knows usually why it happens in, in this oil and gas sector because the technology intensive sector, the technical challenges are frequent. So there's a constant flow of demands on suppliers. It's a project based industry, equipment and infrastructure is customized. You know, the fact is highly customized, you know, demands you know, for the whole supply chain to work together because you know, you're not, not that you make orders for parts and components which are off the shelf, but you have to develop them. And you have incentives for first year suppliers to develop and monitor local suppliers because the top client, the operator, you know, requires you know, a level of sophistication, a level of standards, you know, which is very high. So they push you know, the, the supply chain. So, so how does change happen? You know, as I mentioned before, Petrobras is in a way crowded out all the R&D in Brazil. You know, and just an illustration here, you know, Petrobras has invested 600 million per year in, uh, on R&D and, and innovation. Uh, but this concentration, as I mentioned before, is going to probably come down as in 2017, 80% from Petrobras, 20% from other operators, but it's probably going to come down as you have new interest in Brazil. Uh, picking up you know, from what Tara mentioned, all the models of innovation among petroleum supply firms, I mean, the, the best mode is the combined mode, where you have you know, a collaboration between the suppliers, and suppliers' investment R&D is less important for innovation performance than innovation collaboration. So I just want to take this phrase, you know, and from what I said so far, Brazil doesn't, there's a lot of innovation, mostly concentrated in Petrobras, but there's a potential for collaboration. So using this framework, you know, how you can think about change of the Brazilian oil and gas innovation system. Uh, Petrobras does invest a lot, but when you look at the, at the comparative, you know, Petrobras is uh, like a mid-tier mid in terms of investments in R&D, so competition has also shifted. You know, now you have all these all this top players above Petrobras, now they are in Brazil, so this is going to change, you know, the whole uh, sort of competitive landscape for R&D, for, for res human resources, for technology. So that's one, one thing to keep in mind as we think about change, you know, in the Brazilian oil and gas innovation system. So what are the takeouts from this brief, you know, uh, presentation? Uh, first, you're going to have uh, going to have larger, more diversified oil and gas company into the Brazilian market. Uh, so you're going to probably, you know, a lot of these companies are going to be bringing multiple and competing national supply networks, and now, in a way, also 
feeding back into the sort of the Norwegian uh, research and development innovation, as well as Norwegian suppliers in Brazil. There's going to be more competition, not only for an, from French suppliers, uh, more British suppliers, American suppliers with Exxon, but also Asian suppliers you know, who are increasingly coming into the Latin American market. So it's going to be a much more complex, you know, competitive landscape, you know, sort of the conditions of, uh, of developing oil and gas innovation. And of course, that's part and parcel of what uh, Tara mentioned, you know, because the whole supply chain has become like a global supply chain. And this, uh, this globalization has become much more intense. Another point you know, that I want to make is that finance has become a major drive, and I'm not going to go into the, all the reasons because why finance is in a way going to be driving you know, the oil and gas industry, particularly in Brazil, of course, because of uh, Petrobras financial turmoils. And as we have to push you know, production, finance becomes critical. And there's some, some debate, you know, some of you who are involved in the industry know there's a debate whether to, large, to what extent, you know, finance is going to be driving the, the car, so innovation might take a back seat. So some people are saying a lot of uh, innovation is going to kind of uh, stay back a little bit because now we have to produce. And, people, and who finance, who pays is going to decide what you're going to put in the boat or you're going to put in the platform, and you have to cut costs, you know, and you've got to keep finance. So financial also is going to be critical in that sense, you know, Innovation is going to have to play out finance. Another industrial trend you have uh, worldwide, you know, as uh, Tata mentioned, you know, interest in other sectors, a lot of automotive and machinery, you know, they have this trend where you innovate while you produce. And that has the truism in auto, in auto manufacturing, machinery manufacturing, where companies going to China, going to Mexico, even in Brazil, and more and more they have to do innovation where they produce, exactly because of well, the argument that Tata beautifully made about the nature. The nature of the fields are different, but also the nature of the interests of these multinational companies who operate this global supply chain. Now they have to deliver customized products. Okay, as, uh, as, as Sarah mentioned, a lot of the technology being developed in Norway nowadays has to do with mature fields, but when Norwegian suppliers come to Brazil, they're going to deal with pre-salt. Of course, there is some learning between this technology, but these are different challenges. So in this sense, you know, uh, innovatory producers are going to become more critical. The fact that you have all these uh, science and engineers from Norway here, in a way, is already a, a positive contribution to that because, okay, the Norwegian suppliers, they already collaborate with you in Norway. You know, being here, collaborating with Brazilian universities, in a way, you're closing the circle. You're still not really innovating in, in Brazil, but you're doing some collaboration that can lead you to innovation to the Brazilian market. So you have uh, entering through this, uh, through this level. So in terms of uh, policy recommendations and lessons ahead of us, you know, there's an urgent need to support domestic suppliers to become actors in the oil and gas innovation system. You know, as I mentioned, the domestic suppliers in Brazil, I mean, because we didn't have you know, this, uh, this pool of suppliers that innovation, uh, that, uh, sorry, that Norway had you know, to build upon this oil and gas industry, as uh, Tara mentioned, because they had a maritime sector, they had a, a shipbuilding sector, which was very you know, proficient back then, and they were able to reconvert into oil. We did not have you know, that substratum you know, to build suppliers. So we have to build you know, domestic suppliers, and you have to now to turn them into actors into the innovation system. They become actors in terms of manufacturing, improving their manufacturing capabilities, but they don't do a lot of innovation. Of course, because they're smaller, they don't have the capacities. So I think uh, part of the challenge for policymakers in innovation in Brazil, in building this innovation system in Brazil, is that exactly how you promote innovation within these small suppliers, how you provide them with absorptive capacity you know, to transfer technology and to start developing their own technology. So in the end, you know, how you move from, from, from so-called collaborative upgrading, you know, which is a reality of the of the, of the supply industry in Brazil to so-called collaborative innovation, which is seen that has been one of the drivers for the innovation in Norway. So thank you very much, and I'm, I want to be short so we can have time for, for, for questions and answers also time. Thank you. In your presentation, you have focused on, I mean, uh, the vendor that has been operating from 14 to uh, 30 years and, and, and older companies. And you say that the growth is uh, highest at the established uh, vendor or service companies. What about the younger companies? I mean, those that really uh, recently established from zero to 14 years. How are they doing? Um, I mean, there's, there's, the younger companies know as a, it was part of the final 
slides there, no, they, they don't do as much upgrading, perhaps because they don't still have the organizational skills to do that. They're usually much smaller companies to a large extent. And of course, you know, breaking into this market is very hard, as you know. <laughs> so smaller companies, so this whole, uh, I mean, this, this discussion goes in time, I'll give it back to her, you know, the so-called uh, KBIs, knowledge-based in industries, you know, companies, who kind of develop, an you know, original technology and they launch into this market. Whereas in Norway, you know, the, so the entry points for these KBIs, you know, is, uh, is already available because you have the research institute, so they have mechanisms in Brazil, we still don't have that. And perhaps that will change, you know, because uh, in a way, Petrobras didn't, so I'm not going to go a lot into that, but Petrobras organizational structure, you know, wasn't in a, in a way impermeable to that. So it's very hard to break into this, uh, into this market. So although there's the exceptions to the rule, you know, that prove the rule. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, José, I'm from Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and I work, we work in another way, with young companies and the open new market. Uh, same uh, in our students in, in last month uh, participated in, uh, in Oslo Innovation Week and saw the many different companies and the spin-off of this technology to develop more about the energy, renewable, renewable energy. And the, our, my ask to you is about how we open uh, this market to young companies in Brazil and young people and change this old culture. Great question. I think the, the challenge, you know, as I mentioned, we have to change the structure, have to improve, you know, the, so the financing for this company that is happening already. But in the end, you know, how you break into this market. So we're probably going to need a lot more collaboration between uh, not only the first year suppliers, the Ackers and the FMCs and, and the Lumbergers, but also serve perhaps, you know, this model you know, for innovative companies, you no, know, just an idea, you no, know, I'm not saying that's, the, that's the, the way to go, but you have to bring like second and third supplier, third, third level suppliers to collaborate with this young company because these domestic suppliers, they don't have innovation, they don't have technology, they don't have the skills. And these young companies, they do. So how we can match making? So that's probably one, one issue. Well, I think that, that has been a focus of one of these technology programs in Norway, that to bring some of these kind of novel companies with new technologies into the kind of piloting and demonstration phase to actually prove that the technologies would work. So it's based on a collaboration, again, with the, with the oil companies pay part of it and deploy the technology. So the, uh, the, there are specific measures, but I think it's very important for small companies to have substantial support, but very importantly to integrate them into the wider collaborative network because the deployment of the technology will depend on the proven concept, right? So this is this is kind of support for not only upfront early stage R&D, but these kind of more uh, piloting type of programs is, is probably very instrumental to, to be able to accomplish that. One more yes, that's a question to both of you. Uh, it has to do with the notion of convergence between branches and industries. and. Uh, if you look at the oil and gas industry separately, you can understand the innovation and how things develop in one branch. How does innovations across branches? Um, how, how are they? How do they? How do you measure it, and how do you understand it with respect to innovation in the oil and gas industry? That's the question I have. When you talk about branches, you're talking about industrial sectors. Industrial sectors. Okay. I mean, um, I mean just in the case of Brazil, no measuring these things. I mean. I mean, I always envious of the Norwegian uh, research because they have these databases where they have you know, information about the suppliers. In Brazil, as I mentioned, you know, when you start thinking about suppliers in Brazil, we don't have any database. So I had to build, you know, I, I had a slide, you know, from uh, 3,000 suppliers on killed from uh, Petrobras list and from other list, and you know, we able to interview 600. So that's a problem, how you get information. And of course, as I mentioned, these 600 suppliers, they came from other industrial sectors. And of course, there was part of a lot of government efforts to bring, you know, new suppliers into the oil and gas industry. And that was part of that paid off, you know. But as I said, a lot of the supplies came, uh, came from the foodstuff industry, for example, from the aeronautics industry. And what the importance of that was, uh, which was also a point that was made by Tata, which uh, I want to emphasize, you know, what's the importance of that for Brazil? Of oil and gas is, is more important than oil and gas itself, exactly for the reason you just raised, you know. Because this is an industry you know, who, in a way, has, uh, is able you know, to pay um, 
higher cost, I mean, pay for higher development, development costs. So these smaller companies are able to develop much faster. And as you know, the, the big problem of Brazilian industry and Brazilian economy is the very low productivity. You have a stagnant productivity. So in a way, if you're able to develop these supplies in oil and gas, and then they're going to fit up into the other sectors. Because they provide, you know, to Petrobras, they provide to Akers, to FMC, but they also provide to other Brazilian companies. So the oil and gas sector has a possibility, I'm not saying that's happening, that's some inkling that's happening, to, in terms of driving productivity growth in other sectors through the oil and gas sector. Um, I will kind of focus on the, how, how we measure it, because in our data set, we have mapped every uh, product or every technology or service that each of the company have in all markets. So we have a very detailed uh, image of every market that a petroleum supplier is involved in. So, and we know that actually the majority, 60% of petroleum suppliers also have products or services in non-petroleum markets. So we can, we can just kind of look at that. In addition to the transfer of technologies and so on, which I think the convergence issue that you're addressing, we're also trying to look into that to see to what extent these technologies are moving across different domains of science. So we have another uh, kind of uh, another PhD student who's looking at that, looking at the whole kind of movement of, of knowledge across the different domains. But uh, we will get back uh, maybe in Oslo and we can talk a bit more about that. But it's an interesting question. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we're moving uh, north. For a guy from the Arctic, that's always positive. Uh, we're for the next uh, sp uh, Norwegian uh, speech. We are uh, going to Trondheim. Trondheim, the very foundation of Norwegian engineering, should I say? Uh, we had Good a. Good morning, Rio. We had a. My name. Right. Uh, <coughs> um, <laughs> we we uh, we had a we had a, a a a college there, a technical college there for from 1910 until 1996, and then it changed name uh, to and was integrated into the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Rumors have it that people still wake up at night crying over the loss of the name uh, Norwegian Technical College. Um, <coughs> But now we are sort of, um, we're moving into the sort of the very essence of the distressed professor. Uh, because we are now having a, a video um, a speech here. Uh, because Jon um, Husta, um, uh, Johan, oh, so, sorry, Johan Husta, he, uh, he, he, had, he not only forgot that he had a son, uh, because when he remembered, he also remembered that he is getting married, so he can't come. <laughs> so <laughs> that is really sort of, it is very high on that scale of the, the distressed professor. Oh, I have a son. Oh, he is getting married. Okay, I can't come. Okay, so here it goes. So we're getting this speech over video. Please, go ahead. Good morning, Rio. My name is Johan Husta and I am director of NTNU Energy, a strategic research area. The title of my presentation today is Energy Research and Innovations in Norway. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person today, so I will do this presentation digitally, decentralized from Norway and decarbonized with low CO2 footprint just like the characteristics of the future energy system. I will talk brief about the energy resources in Norway, new developments of traditional energy systems, strategic directions, organization and funding, research institution involved, driving forces and enabling technologies, as well as new opportunities and Norwegian recipe for success. We have abundant natural resources in Norway. We have 30% of the Europe's hydropower resources, more than 50% of Europe's gas resources, 75% of Europe's oil resources, and we are only 1% of the Europe's population. 
We have more than 100 years history of education, research and innovation. in hydropower. <laughs> the blue dots on the map to the right, you see the hydropower plants are distributed all over the country. And as you can see to the left, um, new small hydropower stations have a very modern architecture expression as well as modern design. If you look at hydropower in Norway, um, the electricity production is more or less 96% of hydropower. It is the largest in Europe and number six in the world. As I mentioned, 30% of hydropower capacity in <clears throat> Europe comes from Norway and 50% of the storage capacity comes from Norway. We have more than 1,500 hydropower plants and and installed capacity of almost 32 gigawatts. The generation in average is a little bit more than 140 terawatt hours. And we consume a little bit less so that we have possibilities to export in a typical average year. Hydropower making clean electricity made the metal industry in Norway very environmentally friendly. And at the bottom, you see a list of companies, most of them in the international metal market. And further, in the silicon materials business, wafer production for solar cells was developed for export year, early 2000 and made the solar adventure possible even in our cold and dark country. Deregulation of the Norwegian electricity market in the 90s, coupled to further development of transmission capacities in the Nordic electricity market, created one of the first markets-based system for electricity in the world, called Norpool. Norpool runs the leading power market in Europe and offers day-ahead and intraday markets to customers. This market is taking advantage of the different characteristics between hydropower, nuclear power, and other thermal energy power plants. Green lines on the map, as you can see, are land-based transmission lines. Red lines are cable at the seafloor. Possible and planned interconnection capacity expansion to Germany and UK are estimated to increase the capacity from 4.8 gigawatts to 11.5 gigawatts. However, recent results from Entenu and Sintef in Trondheim show this capacity can all be almost doubled without any direct environmental consequences. By refurbishing old machineries and plants as well as increase the number of tunnels between the reservoirs at different elevations. Norwegian hydropower can thus balance intermittent renewables like solar and wind power in Europe and become what we call a battery for Europe. Now, moving from hydropower to petroleum, the petroleum industry has over 50 years of history and development to become Norway's most important industry. In 2014, it accounted for over 50% of all Norwegian exports and about 30% of government revenues. Different systems have been developed from platform-based systems and technologies in the 80s subsea and floating systems in the 90s, as well as uh, subsea to beach later, made possible with research-based knowledge from multi-phase flow. Technology has been key to the development of the Norwegian continental shelf and a successful Nor <coughs> Norwegian supplier industry. 
This history and development, I suppose, is much closer to your heart than the higher power, right? Knowledge and competence in one area can be used in other areas or sectors. If you look at offshore oil and gas knowledge and technologies, this has competence has been used to develop offshore wind technology. And the world's first <clears throat> offshore floating wind farm established in UK is raised by Equinor. The development presented so far have not been possible without the different stakeholders shown in the next slide. In other words, to success in accelerating the research and innovation to market process, it's of utmost importance to develop enabling systems for such a process. Policymakers must set directions and establish incentives, like the Paris Agreement. Academia <clears throat> will develop new knowledge and technologies, and industry must scale up and demonstrate technologies. Funding is, of course, mandatory for success. The government in Norway wants to scale up research and innovation in developing technologies to address both the climate and energy challenges, as well as the transition to a low carbon society. The Energy 21 strategy describes a concerted national effort to strengthen research, developments, demonstration and commercialization of technologies that can solve challenges for the land-based energy industry in Norway. Public funding bodies to achieve those goals put up in Energy 21 are Energy X and Climit. Funding for industrial projects and demonstrations are performed through Innovation Norway and Innova. Oil companies, universities, research institutions, suppliers and government cooperate through Oil and Gas 21 to develop and implement the national technology strategy for Norway. Oil and Gas 21 works to inspire the development and use of high competence and technology to solve challenges for the petroleum industry in Norway. Public funding or petroleum research is mainly organized through the research programs Petromax 2 and Demo 2000 at the Research Council in Norway. These programs contribute to achieve the goals set in the oil and gas 21 strategy. The Energy X program comprises research in a wide variety of subjects as politics, economy, societal framework and regulations, renewable energy technology and systems, energy conversion and end use, as well as fundamental new concepts and innovations. All together necessary to develop an efficient and low carbon energy system. The main objective of the Centers for Environmentally Friendly Energy Research Scheme is to establish time-limited research centers which conduct concentrated, focused and long-term research of high international standard in order to solve specific challenges in the energy sector. There are today 11 such centers within renewable energy, energy efficiency, social sciences, and CO2 management. The FME scheme will encourage enterprises to innovate by placing stronger emphasis on long-term research and by making it attractive for enterprises that work on the international area to establish R&D activities in Norway and also to stimulate researchers training in fields of importance to the user partner and encourage the transfer of research based knowledge and innovation and technologies to be taken further to achieve innovations by the partners. 
There is traditionally a long timeline from fundamental and basic research in technologies to market introduction. And there are many different funding mechanisms available along the whole value chain. However, there is a lack of mechanisms coordinating different funding bodies. So innovations can move smooth from one uh, funding agents to the other through the whole system. A new initiative called Pilot E is established to account for that. Pilot E is a fast track process where the results from innovative projects in the research council find funding and guiding from Innovation Norway through the whole value chain to ANOVA for the first demonstration in the market without making a new application for each step. The first area where Pilot E was tested was in the maritime market for developing electric ferries for shorter transport distances. A parallel to the fast diffusion of electric cars in Norway bringing the transport sector closely integrated with the stationary electric energy sector. Different energy research institutions apply for funding from the European Union, mainly to the Horizon 2020 program for energy projects, the world's largest public funding research program. And in the future, this will be Horizon Europe the new program. Institutions and researchers can actively influence future topics and calls through participating in different strategic initiatives like the Strategic Energy Technology Plan, the SET plan, as well as participating in the activities of the European Energy Research Area, just to give a couple of examples. Energy research in Norway is performed to various degrees from universities and research institutions located across the whole country. We have 11 universities and three research institutions all together. First, NTNU. The Norwegian University of Science and Technology has a mandate from the Parliament to develop a strong profile in science and technology to, and to create multidisciplinary research. NTNU works in close collaboration with industry in many centers and projects in the energy area, from basic research in nanotechnology for materials and solar cells batteries and fuel cells to more applied research and the successes in hydropower technology and oil and gas as have been seen and presented earlier as concrete examples. Anthony is further known to have a strong innovation culture. To give a recent example in the oil gas segment, Anthony recently organized fact-finding meetings with 41 oil and gas companies, service companies, oil and gas 21, and other organizations as a basis for developing a new strategy for oil and gas research and innovation. Developing cost-effective new solutions in six areas came out as a result of the fact-finding process both in the areas like enabling petroleum technologies, efficient boosting, as well as in the environmental care area. Digital and automated solutions were the common denominator for the different domains. The University of Oslo, being a broad-based university, a classical university, where energy is one of three priority areas comprising materials for energy, energy system, carbon capture and storage, as well as sustainability as subjects. 
in particular strengths in the geoscience area with research on more fundamental geological processes and geophysical analysis are performed. Also, an example in the ICT area where the Sirius Center work on scalable data and digitalization through the whole value chain of oil and gas industry. At the University of Bergen, an example of geoscience collaboration project in cooperation with the University of Oslo and Brazilian partners is highlighted. Joint PhDs and postdocs, supervision and mobility are important aspects. This is an example of cooperation and use of complementary expertise we are looking for in the workshops and discussion later today and tomorrow and further along. The research focus at the University of Stavanger is mainly concentrated on chemistry in various aspects, such as hydrates, corrosion, electrochemistry, oil field production and environmental protection. In addition, the University in Stavanger also run the National Center for Increased Oil Recovery in cooperation with IRIS and if now as part of NORS, I'll come back to that, and IFE, Institute for Energy Technology. So, over to the research institutes. Sintef, being one of the largest independent research institutions in Europe, has the major activity in, in Trondheim and is cooperating closely with our university and TNU in Trondheim, as well as cooperation with the University of Oslo. Established almost 70 years ago by NTNU, Sintef is mostly performing applied research very often with industrial collaboration, both in Norway as well as internationally. In renewable energy technologies, oil and gas technologies, and processes, as well as other aspects in energy. Sintef is very successful in cooperation project with the Horizon 2020 in the European Union. Looking more detailed into the oil and gas sector, Sintef performs research in close collaboration with international industries, among them Brazilian companies. The oil and gas sector has had a downturn in the previous years, but now in the up upturn, an expansion of several areas is experienced, like in the reservoir, marine environmental studies, subsea field developments, as well as digital technologies and systems. Institute for Energy Technology has had its strongest focus historically in the nuclear safety area, but also in oil and gas industry like multiphase flow models and calculations, corrosions, traces for improved oil recovery, recovery, as well as materials and systems for solar cell technology, fuel cells and wind technologies. NORS was established a few years ago as a merger of several minor research organizations coupled to universities such as in Bergen, which is the headquarter, Stavanger, Agder, Tromsø, etc. Research activities both within oil and gas as well as in renewable en energy is highlighted. In Bergen in particular, which has a strong competence within the climate research area. The main driving forces in the energy sector can be described as 3D. Stationary renewable energy systems is characterized by developing from large-scale top-down systems to decentralized and digitalized systems utilizing Internet of Things, uh, automation and artificial intelligence, because these systems now is much closer to the customer and more decentralized. It can also be in nanotechnology and biotechnology as well. For the oil and gas industry, it's important to handle two economies in the future. 
the traditional economy as well as the carbon economy. Developing technology and systems for efficient decarbonization is of utmost importance in the year to come. So, the new opportunities regarding the traditional hydropower and oil and gas industry in Norway lies in using hydropower in a new way and for a new market. As a flexibility service provider to Europe, building up of a large-scale intermittent renewable energy system like solar and wind in Europe. The oil and gas industry must handle the carbon budget by carbon capture and storage and hydrogen as a new energy carrier in the long term in addition to traditional economy. The reuse of knowledge, competence and technologies in the new areas like offshore wind is and will become more important in the future. Research and innovation are driving forces in an energy transition towards a low carbon society in the future. We need a triple helix thinking to achieve this transition. Trust-based long-term collaboration between partners are necessary to accelerate the transition and both new knowledge, technology, efficient incentives and demonstration projects are needed to find the right transition path towards a low carbon society. Thank you and good luck with the rest of the seminar. Thank you too. Thank you too. <laughs> Not bad. He went overtime without being here, actually. So that's uh, that's not that's not bad. <laughs> we have a spare voucher for the lunch if someone is uh, is extra hungry. Well, I I, I have to say uh, um, uh, as a as a quite experienced organizer of events, uh, there are speakers that simply send a short email can come. Uh, this is really uh, uh, different, can come, but I will make this, it's uh, extraordinary. So um, that's, that's uh, really good, very impressive. Thanks so much for this, uh, this um, uh, presentation of uh, very much uh, what's going on in Norway on the research area on energy. Now we will ha have a, um, an industrial perspective, not a, a, a research perspective from this side of the Atlantic um, uh, by an international oil company. I believe the biggest international ones, is, is, isn't, isn't it? After, I think so. Um, uh, Shell is, a, anyhow, a major company here. Please welcome Professor Ivan Olive. No, sorry, sorry. Ali Brandenburg. Sorry, sorry about that. Please come to the stage. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Uh, sorry to disappoint you, I'm not Professor Ewan. <laughs> so, so it's an honor to be with you here today at this auspicious uh, event. Uh, and thank you for the invitation uh, coming from Professor Ritzka Hirschmann and the organizing committee uh, today. Um, it's, uh, it's actually a, a, a special year for us. I don't know uh, uh, if, if many of you are aware. Uh, Shell is celebrating an anniversary this year. We have been in Brazil for 105 years. So and in that period, uh, we've seen a, a fair bit of change. Uh, not me personally. Right? <laughs> But it's fair to say that you cannot be successful as a, as a company uh, for that length of time without being uh, sensitive to the changes in the environment around you. And, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, moving forward, well, I hope we can be uh, doing the same uh, in this, this uh, exciting period of the industry with the, uh, the, the, the changing uh, energy demands uh, around us. 
Uh, my talk today, I would like to share with you is about the, uh, the Brazil perspective on the uh, technology development here. But before I go into the details, the lawyers asked me to share this uh, important message with you. Basic, basically, advising you not to buy and sell any shares based on what I'm telling today. So, um, Shell, Shell has a long history of uh, technology uh, development, and uh, around the world we have uh, three uh, global hubs, uh, one in the US, in Houston, one in the Netherlands, and more recently uh, a global hub has been established in uh, India, in Bangalore. And uh, supporting those uh, global hubs, we have more regional centers to provide the specific know-how and partnerships. Uh, why do we have this, this global technology uh, development? It's not because we can. It's because there is a purpose for the technology that we develop. We, we, we aim to develop technology that addresses questions that are relevant to our business and that will allow us to enter new regions, and, and one of so, such regions is the, uh, the deep water, where uh, last month we celebrated uh, our 40th year of, of deep water uh, technology. Uh, started, of course, in the Gulf of Mexico, but in Brazil we also have a very strong deep water uh, technology present. Um, so this is uh, one of the purposes of having a, a technology hub here in Brazil. Uh, the other trigger is, is uh, from the regulatory uh, environment. It's fair to say that uh, the, uh, one of the triggers for, for us having a technology uh, center here is by the, the, uh, the levy tax, which is a regulatory uh, system in Brazil, which um, indicates for large fields that 1% of the gross revenue uh, is to be invested in technology development. And the oil companies have been given the mandate to find valuable investments for this, this uh, uh, substantial amount of money. Uh, with the advent of the pre-salt in the last decade, the, uh, the size of this, uh, this funding uh, stream has, has exploded. Yeah. It is uh, uh, close to 10% of what Shell invests in uh, technology globally. So how do we try and invest this money? We, we seek opportunities in technology that will uh, provide value enhancement to the oil industry and, of course, to, to, to Shell's uh, interest in the oil industry. Um, we seek for opportunities that have an impact in the country, and uh, it also has to be compliant with the, the regulatory framework that the AMP has put in place here. So to go into a little bit more detail on that, so uh, you know our technology development is, is targeting to meet that uh, levy compliance. We address challenges for the Brazil industry and, and uh, specifically also uh, for this, the strategic resource that the pre-salt is posing. And uh, we seek to enhance capabilities and supply chain opportunities and do uh, research that will support a successful energy transition and also implement the digitalization uh, applications. Uh, these three bubbles here at the, oh, sorry, at the bottom try to depict the, uh, the regulatory framework boundary conditions. Basically, we do this uh, technology development in Brazil. It's done by Brazilians and it's also for Brazil. Yeah? The portfolio that, uh, of, of technologies we are uh, currently looking at is uh, spanning quite a broad range. Uh, it, it, it covers geoscience, improved uh, oil recovery. Uh, it also covers subsea engineering uh, and, and well engineering, uh, but also CO2 abatement and new energies are part of our current portfolio. And I see many of our uh, technology partners here in the audience. So some uh, project examples, just to give you a flavor of the kind of things that we are working on. Uh, 
One is the uh, is an autonomous underwater vehicle, the Flatfish, which is uh, built in order to uh, to do subsea monitoring of the flow lines and to provide uh, early insights into the uh, safe operations and and uh, maintenance requirements in the deep sea. Uh, lowering the cost of doing deep water operations is a, is a main focus of our projects as well, of our technology projects. And the low cost subsea is a program that develops subsea trees uh, at a smaller scale, lower weight, and therefore uh, providing lower cost solutions uh, in collaboration with uh, industry here in Brazil. Um, flexible riser integrity is another important element uh, in the deep water uh, EP industry here in Brazil. Uh, there is an enormous number of, of risers in place. I don't know the exact number, maybe somebody in the audience knows. But the, the monitoring of all these risers to be operating in a, in a safe uh, uh, fashion is, a, is an important aspect. And by, by doing the integrity uh, monitoring in a, in a different way, we can be uh, more proactive and more timely in any replacements. Uh, Intelligent completions is another element, which is uh, providing us, hopefully, technologies that will allow us, in the pre-salt, to, to uh, be more efficient in uh, bringing the right recovery for, for the, and maximize the resources for the nation. We're also very proud that we are developing a, uh, an advanced EOR lab here in Brazil, actually here in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, this, is, uh, this is really a first. It's, it's at the, the cutting edge of technology uh, globally. And uh, I saw the, uh, the professor that is responsible for this lab here to earlier today. Digital rock fix physics is also uh, a, uh, an exciting technology project uh, going on. Uh, together with uh, Halliburton and Ingrain here in Rio. And uh, CO2 abatement, we have a project in uh, Sao Paulo where there's a large uh, center established, the Research Center for Gas Innovation, where we're looking at solutions to, to, uh, to capture um, CO2 uh, you know, from, from uh, you know, that it's generated from, from Transforming, transforming our hydrocarbons to energy, but also looking at solutions for the CO2 that is associated in large volumes with the, uh, the pre-salt uh, hydrocarbon resources. And then finally, the, the new energies research. We've just opened a, a center uh, recently, also in Sao Paulo State, in col collaboration with FAPESP, where we are addressing specific challenges uh, in the so you can see here on the map, we have a large number of, of uh, uh, universities and research institutes that we're currently collaborating with. Those are the blue dots on the map. Uh, and also uh, a fair number of industrial partners. Uh, and the, the type of technology we're aiming to develop is very much to really bring capabilities uh, to the country in those um, in the, uh, the geosciences, the, uh, the problem that we're trying to address, uh, the goal we're trying to reach is to improve our pre-rail predictions. And uh, we do this by, by uh, looking into geological fundamental research on different scales, from a, from a basin scale all the way to the pore scale, uh, to, to better understand the uh, controlling factors of, of basin formation, uh, and how does that uh, influence the development gas oil ratio. Um, can we predict the CO2? Because you know this is something that has an important impact on the uh, the value proposition, um, and also questions of you know the the very unusual reservoir that we have here in the pre-salt in Brazil. Uh, there's a there's a lot of very fundamental questions still to be answered there. The other branch for subsurface technology geoscience is on geophysical images and the turnaround time for the oil forward, right? Um, 
the uh, for for a setting like the pre-salt uh, velocity models of the overburden are essential uh, for a depth conversion uh, and for for proper assessment of you know the, the, the depth to target but also the volumes in place uh, quantitative interpretation and uh, in support of reservoir prediction is a big challenge in the pre-salt as well uh, and uh, then on the uh, technology side, the, uh, we see that, uh, for instance, wide azimuth acquis seismic acquisition is uh, a technology that is really already available, but not available in Brazil due to the, uh, the regulatory, regulatory constraints here. Uh, but that is an area where uh, hopefully we'll be able to achieve more penetration in Brazil in the future. Uh, i just show this uh, graph to the side where you see a comparison between uh, the Gulf of Mexico and Brazil in terms of seismic coverage for uh, narrow azimuth seismic on this side here. Yeah. So the green bar is the Gulf of Mexico, the blue bar is the uh, coverage in Brazil. So you see, uh, you know, Brazil in terms of, of seismic coverage is uh, about half of what the Gulf of Mexico currently has, but it's rapidly growing. Uh, but on the wide azimuth side, the comparison to between Gulf of Mexico and Brazil is quite uh, different. Um, if we go to the oil ocean bottom node system, it's more equal. And this is an area where uh, Brazil will soon overtake uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Currently, it's still largely aimed at uh, 4D. It's been very successful in the, uh, the post-salt section in, uh, in Brazil already. Uh, the challenge now is, can we can we replicate that success in the pre-salt? The jury is still out, but we are hopeful that it will help uh, underpin future decisions. So on the uh, improved hydrocarbon recovery side, that's a, a, a very important topic. Currently, the average recovery factor is about 21% for, for Brazil. And with the size of the resources, you can imagine that if you can increase that by only 1%, it's got a big value. Uh, so we are actively looking at uh, various technologies that may support that. Uh, technologies like uh, water flood, water alternating with gas, uh, doing more complex fluid analyses, uh, conformance control like polymer floods and foam injection to retard the water and gas uh, breakthrough that, that will happen in the fields. Uh, Looking at poor scale rock fluid interaction, as I, as I mentioned, the carbonates, the reservoir rocks here are very unusual. So the details of the interaction of the, of the hydrocarbons with the reservoir rock is an area of, of, of uh, research still. The other branch is reservoir management and surveillance. And this is especially with the uh, revolution of digitalization happening in an area where we can really make big progress. We're looking at in-well sensing tools and technologies, uh, also low-cost 4D. And I put here an example from the BC10 field of a, 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 a reservoir slice and a time lapse uh, where you can see the uh, red indicating the softs, which, which are associated with the gas cap, and the blues associated with the hards, which are related to the water that is being injected into this field. And you can see how having such a time lapse at uh, regular moments during its, the field history can be very helpful in, in planning the, uh, the, the management of the reservoir and future infill drilling. OK, so what does digitalization really mean for Shell? So our focus is very much on the uh, digital technologies that can really help address our current business ch challenges. Um, so they need to have an impact on the uh, industry. It's, it's not really new. Uh, it's also not an outcome. And uh, we don't think it's a one-off of thing that only exists in the future. It is here, it is now. Uh, and the definition might be the use of digital technologies to change a business model and provide new revenue and value-producing opportunities. So as I said, digital is, is really not new, right? But the availability of technology, data, and capability is growing at an expen exponential rate. So the technology is becoming faster and cheaper. The cost of sensors has come down dramatically. The cost of bandwidth 
is, has gone down dramatically. Uh, the cost of processing power in the last decades come down 50 times. And the cost of, of storage uh, in the cloud has really come down. And our, but at the same time, our data is growing exp exponentially. In the last decade, more than 40 times. So 90% of all data that was created uh, has been created in the last two years. So how do we see digitalization delivering value in, our, in the upstream and, and integrated gas uh, branches of our business? Now, first of all, we see it having a big impact potentially on safety and environment. Yeah. So it will help us achieve our goal of goal zero, no harm to people. The, uh, on the exploration side, uh, we believe it will help us to, uh, to get better subsurface images and hopefully to see what others cannot, or not yet. Um, on the reservoir modeling element, it, it will optimize recovery and help us manage uncertainties to underpin better uh, strategies and field decisions. And on the engineering and construction, it will help in the efficient execution of capital projects. And in well delivery, we're seeking technologies to deliver best-in-class wells, and on production side, uh, very much focusing on increasing the reliability and the availability of production. So some examples that we've al already doing, and uh, I already told you about the uh, autonomous underwater vehicle, which is uh, uh, developed in collaboration with uh, Sanai Simatech, uh, where they have a very strong robotics group. Uh, the digital riser monitoring system I mentioned before, but also integrity management for FPSO, so using robots for, uh, to monitor the integrity of the hulls. Geophysical computing, there's huge potential for uh, accelerating. Digital rock is a very exciting field where uh, digitalization is a you know, critical element of, of being able to translate the images that you can make with high resolution scans into reservoir properties like porosity, permeability, uh, capillary entry pressures, and rel perm. And the well advisor uh, is, a, is a technology that uh, uh, we're, we're looking at to make use of the vast volume of data that exists from past wells and translate it into uh, useful information to help well engineers to make decisions. So the last thing I wanted to share with you is uh, an example of how we collaborate with uh, startup companies here in Brazil. This is a uh, recent initiative um, which was derived from the Shell Game Changer Plan. And it's, uh, it's an initiative aimed to stimulate Brazilian innovation uh, and that ecosystem that some of our previous uh, presenters spoke about. The, uh, we had a, a, a challenge, uh, a call for, for ideas and proposals recently, uh, where we asked uh, universities and startups to come with uh, proposals that would support our digitalization agenda um, along th uh, three main subject areas. One was real-time monitoring, uh, one was on, cont on control, and the other was on data analytics. And uh, here at the bottom, I show three of the, 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 the the winning proposals. So uh, one was on uh, by a startup called PhD Soft uh, that proposed a digital twin of uh, FPSO top sites, um, PixForce, which is a, an oil spill monitoring uh, technology to uh, detect and make early warnings through the use of satellite images, and then the last is a startup called Taya Labs, um, which has a technology on data visualization building a platform for large volume and unstructured data analysis through uh, automatic image analysis. So uh, we're very pleased that uh, with the, and congratulate these three winners. So to finish up, the uh, digital transformation is really an ecosystem of collaboration where we see that uh, we as an oil company work together on the one hand with academia and startups, and at the other end, 
with suppliers and service providers and uh, the future is bright. It's up to us to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali. Um, another junior mistake. I, I forgot to mention that you are, uh, in fact, the regional chief uh, geologist for uh, new ventures in, in uh, Shell. According to LinkedIn, that's your title, Otto Haig. <laughs> if you haven't updated li uh, LinkedIn, it's not my fault, okay. All right, uh, last uh, 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 speech, now before uh, lunch, quantum uh, technology. I um, had to take almost half an hour on Wikipedia this morning to un really understand what it's really all about, this quantum stuff. Um, so I don't really have to be here. I could go for lunch now because I know all about it, but I'll stay anyhow because I don't have anything else to do. No, please, uh, it will be very interesting to hear uh, from you. Now, finally, Mr. Professor Ivan from CBPF. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, uh, I am Ivan Oliveira. I am a, I'm a physicist, and I work here at CBPF. So I would like to thank the organizer for the, giving me the chance to come here to show you some of novelties which are coming from this area of physics called quantum information processing, and uh, some applications which uh, people believe may become important in the next years and new technologies which can be used in the oil industry. And uh, I will keep this talk, of course, in a non-specialist level. And uh, but if anyone wants to look uh, look for me afterwards to ask for the day, we can talk. Uh, well, I hope this uh, will be open your appetite for the next section at Rascal. Okay, so uh, I will start with a very basic, uh, very basic description of an experiment, which is made by a graduate students with an uh, experiment of uh, interference uh, between waves. And uh, if, you, if you have a light source, uh, like bulbs, uh, the light is emitted in front, front, wave fronts like these ones. If these waves strike a screen with a double slit, each hole becomes a secondary source of light. And then the light coming from each hole, they superimpose in space. And because they are coming from different positions, this uh, superimposition can produce, uh, can add the amplitudes of the light or, do, to, or to destroy it. And so that creates a pattern like this on a screen, with a, which is a very classical um, interference pattern. This is, a, this is a classical experiment with light, which every um, physics or engineer graduate student can do at uh, university. But uh, since 1940, 1924, uh, the, uh, Maurice de Broglie on his PhD thesis uh, show or postulated the idea that uh, matter can also have a wave behavior. And what we see here on this sequence is, a, is an experiment actually made uh, with electrons. Electrons are sent to strike a double slit screen like the previous one. And after that, they reach a, a screen producing these dots. So if you keep sending these electrons, at the beginning, the distribution on the screen looks very uh, random. But as the particle accumulates on the screen, here we see clearly a wave pattern, which is interference it interferes pattern, the same one which is seen on the light experiment. So this is an experiment which actually demonstrates the wave nature of particles, okay? And, uh, well, this has many important applications amongst which, uh, which the, uh, these electron microscopes, which uh, everybody nowadays use. But the, the important thing for uh, what regards this talk today is that because these are waves, but at the same time, 
they are particles with mass, they can sense gravity. So this is the important uh, important uh, information which will which will be useful afterwards. So this is the the first fundamental quantum property I will show. I will show another two fundamental quantum property, and then uh, following that, uh, three technological applications with possible consequence in the research of oil and, and gas. Okay. Uh, well, the second important property is that the uh, the energy levels of atoms uh, has a discrete spectrum. That means that atoms cannot absorb energy or light with any wavelength, but with only with a very definite wavelength. And uh, this is shown here. Uh, this is the, the, the hydrogen absorption spectrum and the emission too. So when you excite an atom, the electrons go to a higher energy levels and then they decay back to the lower energy levels emitting light. And the emission is also in very well defined wavelengths. Okay? This is an example of uh, helium. And uh, sorry, this is hydrogen, this is helium. And, and this is actually uh, the, the way that astrophysicists know how the universe, uh, what the universe is made of, by looking at this uh, emission, emission spectra of matter from uh, different parts of the universe. And the physicists represent this uh, with a, like that. Each horizontal line here represents a level of energy. So if you excite the the atom to one of these, it decays back, emitting that very precise uh, wavelength light. Okay, the third one is a is, is the most certainly the most strange property of a, a, a quantum system, which is called entanglement. Physicists do not know what entanglement is, and nobody knows what entanglement is. But uh, physicists learn to learn to, to apply these things, even if we don't understand them. This is the advantage of physics. Uh, well, the, this thing is so strange that the, the most famous uh, scientist to oppose these ideas was Albert Einstein, which actually considered quantum mechanics a mix of mathematics with black magic. And uh, Einstein referred to entanglement as a spooky action. And, uh, well, that, that there was a very famous debate between Einstein and Bohr, and uh, at the end of the day, Einstein gave up with, uh, of, of, of this discussion. But entanglement is real and uh, is, a, is a kind of a statistical correlation, non-classical correlation between um, uh, particles or, or individuals in a, in, a, in a quantum system. And Entanglement is the responsible for this uh, now uh, famous thought experiment proposed by Schrodinger, in which a cat could be dead and alive at the same time. These are on T-shirts nowadays. Well, but at the same time, entanglement is a fundamental nature resource, which actually exponentially speed the the processing in, uh, in, in quantum computers. So quantum computing is the, is the holy grail of this area. Everybody now is working, to, is trying to, to, beat, uh, to, to build a useful uh, quantum computer. Okay, so these are the, the three uh, quantum properties I, I would like to show you. And now uh, I will start showing you some applications of that which can result in important tools for research in the oil industry. Uh, this picture here is a scheme of an experiment of uh, wave interferometry using atoms. So this, uh, this exploit the wave nature of matter. Uh, an atom is prepared in a specific state, which means it's going to a very well-defined uh, flowing in a very well-defined direction. And then at some point, at, at the beginning here, a laser pulse, which is represented by, by this vertical line here, is applied to the, to the atom. 
this laser pulse has the, the same effect as the double slit. It splits the atom trajectory in two parts in space. And then the waves the, fly through different trajectories. And because of that, they sense different values of the gravity field. And uh, in spite of it being so small, uh, the advantage of this scheme is that it can actually measure this very tiny variation of gravi gravity. And then at some other instant of time, a new, another laser pulse uh, makes the opposite. It recombines the trajectories so that the two waves, the two matter, uh, remember that when I, I, I'm talking waves here, but these waves, they are not directly detected as electromagnetic waves. These are quantum waves. These are, uh, it's not observable. This is the, the, the strange thing. Nevertheless, you can make them to interfere here. And this interference here, because the atoms come from, the, these waves come from different positions, like in the previous uh, light experiment, they produce uh, interference pattern here from which I can extract the value of the gravity, uh, the uh, gravitational field, okay? And this can be done with a precision of uh, one part to the billion. So I can, it's, it's very extremely sensitive measurement of uh, uh, the gravitational field can be made. Uh, and here is a, one, experimental, one experimental result on this. The, this is a, a, an experiment. It's not, it's not our experiment, an experiment taken from the literature, um, which was made during a period of uh, 12 hours. 12 hours because on this period, you have the, the phenomenon of uh, the uh, solid and uh, liquid tide. So the, uh, in this period, the, the, the Earth actually is stretched and pulled back. This is called solid Earth tide. And when, when this happens, when the, when the Earth is stretched and pulled back, the local uh, gravitational field change, change in a very small amount. So the experiment, the experiment like this, was made during 12 hours along this uh, phenomenon. And the, the red light, Oh, the red, the red dots you see here, are uh, the result of the of the experiment, and behind that, which you can actually cannot see because it 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 match almost perfectly, but you can see a little here, is the theoretical uh, the theoretical result. So uh, and here, you can see that the variation of the gravitational field in this period is a, a few hundreds nanometers per square second. So it is extremely sensitive. And why this thing is important for the industry of oil and gas? Because gravity is related to mass. So if you can manage to make this kind of experiment along a, a hole in which you expect to have large variations of mass along the, along the, the, the way, then you can sense the variation of gravity and actually make a, they expect to make a, a kind of image or tomography image of uh, whatever is uh, under, underneath, okay? This is, a, uh, this is a page of um, British quantum technologies, which they expect really major advance in the next years using these uh, quantum sensor, sensors for uh, exploiting exploiting uh, reservoirs. Okay, the the second now the second application, which might be become very important, uh, involves diamond, uh, but the cheap ones, fortunately, not the not the expensive ones. And di diamonds are are very interesting materials because they they have a very a peculiar optical properties. Diamond can absorb absorb light and retransmit light in a phenomenon called fluorescence. Fluorescence. I'm sorry if my pronunciation is not too good. Okay? And, uh, and th this is using this application 
because the fluorescence of diamond can be controlled by creating uh, some defects, actually defects, which are called NV centers. This is a, an arrangement of a, a, a diamond crystal, and the, the black spheres here are carbon atoms. If you take one of these carbon atoms off and put a nitrogen in there, this can be done either uh, artificially or can, it also occurs uh, naturally. And in order this nitrogen settles in, the, in this crystal, another carbon has to be kicked off. And the complex here uh, combines a nitrogen and a vacancy, and then the name, NV center, okay? The interesting thing about this NEV center here is that we can control the fluorescence of the diamond crystal by irradiating this thing with laser. So this thing here is capable of absorbing green laser and re-emit light in the red, uh, the red band. So it absorbs green, emits red. This is the fluorescence. But if I put this stuff in a magnetic field and superimpose a microwave radiation field, then I can control the fluorescence. I can control the amount of red light which is being transmitted. This is shown here. This is the frequency of the mi microwave field. And here is the fluorescence. You see that for some, some very specific values of the microwave, you have a drop in the fluorescence. That means this structure here is a sensor to magnetic field. I can measure magnetic fields using this thing. And what's the advantage? It's extremely sensitive. I can detect variations in magnetic field, very, very small variations, also in this scale of one, one part to 10 to 9, something like that. OK? So here is one nice application also a literature application, uh, directing a geophysical problem in which the, the authors took a slice of a geological uh, rock, I think from Australia, I'm not sure. And what they did, uh, they, they want to, to study the, um, the geological history of this, of this uh, piece of rock. And what they did was to uh, spread many of these tiny crystals on the surface of the rock and then look at the fluorescence of the NV centers. And uh, since, the, since these crystals on the surface, they stand close to different uh, uh, minerals with different magnetic properties, by looking up the fluorescence of, fluorescence of, the, of the diamond, they were able to build a, an image of uh, the distribution of uh, magnetic minerals in the in the in the rock, and uh, from that they they can uh, say something about the geological history of this rock. So this is one application. The other application involves a, a problem which is very important also for to understand uh, oil in in rocks in porous media, which is the wettability. This problem, uh, which is, is very it's very hardly understood. Um, is is important to to uh, for the geologists and engineers to say something about the production uh, capability of the of the of the of that uh, uh, reservoir. So here the experiment is: we have a solid surface, and we have an NV center put here. And on the su solid surface, the guys put a very thin uh, film of oil. So the blue here is oil. And here is one single, one single NV center. So it's an it's a atomic dimension here. Okay? And then the oil has hydrogen, and the hydrogen interacts with the NV center. So if I, if I now look at, the, look at the fluorescence of this NV center, I can actually say something about the interaction between the oil and the surface. And here is one of the results. It's, it's actually the, the experiment is, is not a, you have to make a very good statistic because um, well, it's very delicate. 
But the result is uh, you have, th this is the, res the picture which emerged after the analysis of this result here. But here you have the, the solid surface and the NV center, here you have the oil. And actually the, the interpretation says that there must exist a very thin uh, single layer of water molecules on the surface here. And this is less than one nanometer thick. So this is, a, I think it's the first time somebody detects one single layer of water adsorbed on the surface of this thing. And this is something which is very interesting to study wettability. Okay, I, I think I'll, I'll manage to finish in time. So the, the third uh, technological breakthrough is quantum computing. Quantum computing, as I said, is the holy grail of this area, because uh, if, uh, if a true large-scale quantum computer starts working, uh, people believe, at least the physicists believe. Yeah? The physicists are very naive people. Yeah. Uh, they <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, I'm very honest. Uh, but, it, but it's good to, to get funding. Yeah? No, it's very good. <laughs> Okay, see, since last year, IBM announced that they managed to build a, a 50 qubit quantum computer. A qubit is the, uh, the, the information unit for quantum system as much as the bit is for the classical computer. And this whole thing here is just to cool, the, to keep the, the, the ship at the very low temperatures. And the ship, the ship you cannot see so small it is. It's here at the end. Well. Uh, the point is that this 50 qubit thing is already capable to make operations which are impossible for any classical computer you can imagine. It has not been proved yet. People are working to try to prove that, but it's already a, a main breakthrough in the, in the area. There are, there, is, there are many uh, difficulties to be many problems to be solved, but this is so important. And since there is no fundamental, uh, fundamental uh, difficulty to, to build these things, which that uh, uh, people do believe they, they really will be built in the, in the maybe in five to 10 years, we will we'll have uh, uh, some maybe service, not quantum computer to be sold, but you'll be able to buy the, the, the service. The, you, you just propose a problem, they solve and return to you the, 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 the answer. Okay, this, of course, the main ingredient here is entanglement, which uh, I will not go further, but uh, that creates a kind of rush around the world, and many other big companies start announcing um, their own initiative to to build quantum quantum ships, include the Swedish uh, uh, government and um, other main American companies. Well, why quantum computing is so important? I I I have a our group has a has a, a project which is financed by Petrobras, and I every every meeting I have there, I hear this thing of the inversion problem. So this inversion problem is everywhere. So the inversion problem means you can, you can take uh, measurements from the field and from that you have to guess what is under the soil. This is extremely difficult, mathematically ambiguous, it's very, very hard to produce uh, such a thing and takes a lot, lot of time. I, I don't have experience to work with this inversion problem in the, in the, in the company, but the, I heard that it, it takes um, usually many months to process the data they receive, and then they conclude that it's not bad to have to make all, all the experiments. So it's time consuming and money consuming. If a quantum computer could do the same job, this could be dramatically reduced to maybe days or even hours, if it's a full, uh, a full quantum computer working that. What is the good news? The good news is that since the last year, 
there appear a quantum algorithm to make the inversion. So this has been published by a, a group of for many pages, but uh, one of them is F. Lloyd from the MIT, which works with the quantum computing theory. And this uh, paper here shows that if you have a quantum computer, quantum computer working at a large scale, then you'll be able to solve the inversion problem exponentially quicker than any classical computer can do. And uh, exponential means uh, you can go from months to hours or less. This is, a, this is a revolution. So again, there is a, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, wishful thinking on this thing, a lot of uh, technological difficulties to, to be solved, but the, the basis has been demonstrated. The software exists that is, for the first time, a large-scale quantum computer after the announcement of IBM in November of uh, uh, last year, in March of this year, Google also made an announcement that they built, they have succeeded building a quantum ship with uh, 72 uh, qubits. Now, the, the main problem is to put this thing to work and demonstrate it can be controlled and actual, uh, the, the real calculation uh, can be done. Okay, so I think I'm a kind of time. I main conclusions, these things are simple, no. Are they around the corner? No. <laughs> but they can actually be done. Yes, they can do that. Do we have the means to do that? No, we have engineers. Engineers uh, are working for that. So the answer is yes. So I think uh, this is a, a particular feeling of myself. Should we expect a major breakthrough in, say, 10 years' time? Definitely yes. So something important is going to happen on this area in the next uh, 10 years. So have a good lunch at Rascal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for a very, very interesting. I have some questions. I can take them during the lunch. <laughs> well, uh, um, I have a I have a friend up north. Um, he in the 90s he said that uh, he'd wait to update his black and white uh, computer screen until they invent something better than color, he said. So we'll, maybe we'll wait here to update our, our, our uh, computers until this happens. Okay, this is also, I think, a good signal for um, people from embassies and uh, innovation directors and top bureaucrats to, uh, to say that uh, you don't have to come back after lunch because everything is going to be above your head. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, as you all know, parallel sessions after lunch. Don't forget your vouchers. And um, just one reminder, meet here at, uh, after the parallel sessions uh, at 70, 70, uh, at 5.10 for a, uh, a summing up. Uh, Morten Dahlen, the, the, one, the, the, the guy here with the glasses on top of his head, uh, who already stood out as a as a brilliant ASCII of questions, uh, he will do the, the, um, the summing up uh, after that. So please meet here at 5.10 after this. The parallel sessions, you will have to make uh, do with the time and everything alone, uh, but I'm sure that's going to be fine. So don't forget your vouchers. Haskell next. Thank you.